Hello, everybody. Um, thank you so much for the introduction, Avin. So uh, again, my name is Malak Azizieh, and I am a speech and language pathology clinical fellow. I'll be looking at the communication skills of individuals with prosopathies. So I'll be specifically looking at children with cardiofacial cutaneous syndrome and Costello syndrome. So um, I have nothing to disclose. And so I'd like to start by answering what are risopathies. So risopathies are a collection of genetic syndromes that resulting from mutations in genes in the RAS, MAPK uh, pathway. And so there are different types of risopathies. There's neurofibromatosis, there's Noonan syndrome, Costello syndrome, cardiofacial cutaneous syndrome, and among some others as well. And so the RAS pathway is known to be um, responsible for essential cellular functions like cellular movement, cellular growth, and different um, changes in cell type. And so because the RAS pathway plays an important role in these cellular functions, any disruptions to this pathway could cause um, consequences across many different uh, systems in the body. And we see this in the clinical features of children with prosopathies. Um, and so individually, um, although individually each syndrome is quite rare, together the risopathies represent a common group of genetic syndromes that affect one in 1,000 individuals. And so the two risopathies I'll be discussing are Costello syndrome and cardiofacial cutaneous syndrome. Uh, cardiofacial cutaneous syndrome is also known as CFC, and it's caused by mutations in the BRAF, KRAS, MAF2K1, um, and, uh, and some other genes as well. And so the prevalence of CAC is one in 810,000 individuals. And so some of the clinical features seen in these individuals are things like congenital heart defects, um, wide space eyes, some changes and differences in their face and skull st structure, and other concerns, in, including developmental delay and seizures. Um, for Costello syndrome, also known as CS, these are caused, this is caused by mutations in the HRAS genes. The prevalence of CS is 1 in 1,290,000 individuals. Some of the clinical features for these individuals include severe feeding difficulties, um, also differences in their facial and stru skull stru structure, um, as well as some concerns in terms of developmental delay and an increased risk for cancerous and non-cancerous tumors. And so my research project goal was to investigate the, sp the speech and language skills of children with cardiofacial cutaneous syndrome and Costello syndrome. And so I started by performing a liter literature review on, of the existing information um, on the communication skills of these individuals. And so the data that I worked with was collected by Dr. Thompson and Bernice Norman at the conference for CFC and CS in the summer of 2019. And so these conferences are a place where these children and families gather together and they meet all together and um, attend different presentations. And so here the team performed their evaluations and they were able to meet with the children and families as well. And so part of my work was organizing the data, scoring the standardized testing, and then analyzing the data that were collected. And then we discussed some limitations to the study and um, proposed some next steps. And so in terms of communication skills, there is significant variability among children with CFC and CS. So there isn't a complete picture available just yet. Um, so what the research shows thus far is that for both children with CFC and CS, that their understanding of language appears to be stronger than their use of language. And then as well, that there's a general speech and language delay for these children. So for children with CFC, they typically acquire their first words around 22 to 25 months of age, whereas um, for CS, they're acquiring their first words at around 12 to 30 months of age. And then in terms of sentences and phrases for CFC, they're acquiring that at about age seven. And then for children with CS, they're acquiring it between the ages of about four and seven years. Um, and so it's hypothesized that due to a delay in their odor, oral motor development, so this is their use of their tongues, their lip, their teeth, um, and so due to this delay, it might be causing that speech and language delay as well. And so what we see is that as their oral motor structures and functions develop, that at about age seven, there's this increase in that language skill. And then we're seeing this increase through adolescence as well. And so um, it's hypothesized that 
uh, it could be correlated to each other. And then in terms of their delayed language development in their early years, this may suggest that using other forms of communication other than talking verbally could be helpful for these children in those first um, early years of their life. And so um, the data that was collected consisted of three different tests looking at their speech skills, their language skills, and their cognitive skills. For my project, I looked specifically at the case history and language scores for each child. And so um, there were a total of 32 children who participated in the study between the ages of three and 17 years. And so there were 15 individuals with CFC and 17 individuals with CS. And then of the 32 participants, 21 children participated in some form of formal language testing. And so there were eight children with CSD and 13 um, children with CS, so a total of 21. Um, and then of those who received language scores, in order to get a general language ability, the test uses what's called a core language score. So this takes all the subtests and it averages it out to give you one overall language score. And so of those 21 participants, 16 were able to complete all of the subtests needed for the core language score. And so that included six individuals with CFC and 10 individuals with CS. Um, so the test that was used was the clinical evaluation of language fundamentals. And this test separated the children into three different groups. So there were three children between the ages of three and six, there were six children between the ages of six and nine, and there were seven children between the ages of nine and 17. And so an average score on this test is a standard score of 100, which is represented by the red line. And so with a standard deviation of about 15, so at about 85 and below would be considered below average. And so as you can see as a whole, these children are performing um, quite low. So between the below average to low range. And so um, these scores and comparisons should also be interpreted with caution as the original test was not standardized to this population. And there was also smaller uh, sample sizes, which made it hard to compare the groups as a whole. And so here we're looking at the results from the subtests and which may give us more information on the specific communication skills of these children. Um, and so the subtests were measured by scaled scores, which is um, represented in the average is represented in the red line, which is a scaled score of 10 with a standard deviation of two. So anything eight and up would be considered a um, within normal limits. So as you can see, similar to before is that they are scoring pretty low um, considering their scores and um, in the ranges of below average to low. Um, and so as a general observation of the data, it appears that the children with CFC are performing better or have stronger skills um, in the older age group than in the younger age group. And so um, in light of these deficits, these children um, demonstrate great skills that weren't really reflected in these standardized test scores. So an example of this is their social pragmatic skills. So a lot of these children demonstrated great strengths in terms of social pragmatics, which is their social language skills in their daily interactions with their peers, with their friends or their families. And so, um, this includes things like their use of eye contact, their use of gestures and body language and facial expressions. And so something that I was interested in looking at is um, the number of nonverbal children in this group and what future recommendations could be made to support these children. And so from the participants, children who had delayed language acquisition or um, whose primary mode of communication is through other modes than talking were included in this group. And so this consisted of about 41% of the participants, um, 13 individuals. Um, and so of these participants, of the 32 participants, 15 had used some form of AAC. And so AAC stands for alternative and augmentative communication. So this is all the different types of ways of communicating other than speaking verbally. And so we received history and information from children who used sign language, who use communication boards, which is considered low-tech AAC, typically printed on paper or in books, and then also used high-tech AAC, so things like speech generating devices. So this looks like possibly an iPad with an application with words and phrases to communicate. 
Um, and so many of the families reported that these were used occasionally or they were used previously, but inconsistently. And so during the evaluation, we saw the children use sign language the most and that none of the children had used low tech or, uh, or high tech AAC um, either consistently or at all. There was one um, child who used their speech generating device and demonstrated that use, but didn't use it consistently and relied on behavior to communicate. And so in terms of limitations and next steps, so we're looking at, there was a small sample size. So there are not very many children with these conditions. And so this makes recruitment challenging in terms of um, considering things like limited time to test, as well as possibly some challenging measures and the use of um, limited use of AAC during the assessment. In terms of next steps, Dr. Thompson and I will be going to the conference this summer and collecting more data and um, attending the conference to increase the sample size for this research study. Um, and then some other considerations could be allocating some more time for testing, as well as for future studies, looking at things like the communication, communication matrix and including the use of AAC during assessment. Um, so uh, thank you all so much for listening to my presentation. Again, my name is Malak Azizie, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Very nice presentation. Thanks very much. Thank you. Yes, one question I had is whether you also had a nonverbal cognitive assessment on the kids, because it's really hard to interpret their kind of language impairments without knowing where they are in terms of cognition. Yes, so uh, there was actually cognitive testing, so they were using the differential ability scale. Um, however, for my project specifically, I didn't really look at that data and I was just um, looking at the self scores, um, but there was the testing for cognitive skills for the children who were able to um, attend to the testing and who were interested in continuing that testing as well. So um, just a follow up question. So what are you planning to do? I mean, I'm really interested uh, in kind of kind of naturalistic language sampling and communication sampling, which I think actually is better for these kids than standardized tests, which are a little abstract. So what are you going to do in terms of trying to get at the pragmatics and other aspects of kind of social language and social communication? Yeah, I 100% agree with you, and I do think the same thing. So during the study as well, all of the children who were classified in the group of nonverbal were also given the opportunity to have a language sample as well as a play sample that was then to be coded and then analyzed for their specific social pragmatic skills as well as their functional communication. Great, thank you. Thank you so much. The UC Davis Mind Institute was founded in 1998 with the promise to reduce and prevent the disabilities that can be associated with autism and other neurodevelopmental conditions. Every day, our clinicians and researchers make progress on that promise. Our groundbreaking research on autism, fragile X syndrome, chromosome 22Q11.2 deletion syndrome, ADHD, and other conditions associated with disability are helping affected individuals achieve their fullest potential. Please visit our website or our social media platforms to find out more about current studies, upcoming events, and how you can help make a difference.